uh, I would say day two. I'd also like to welcome Tom uh, Seidenson, the IWSB chair, and Galen Hansen, the IESBA uh, CAG chair. Uh, good to see you both again today. Uh, before we, we kick off today, I just want to highlight a couple of points. And, and one is in October of um, this year, the IWSB intends to approve certain conforming amendments to um, IWSAB pronouncements that are included in volume two of the handbook. And uh, the proposed changes to ISRE 2000 series, ISAE 3000 series, ISRS 4000 series, and there'll also um, potentially be um, conforming amendments related to the QM standards. So what we're going to do with these conforming um, amendments is we're gonna send out an email so everyone has a chance to look at them and we will have our due diligence. And to the extent that you have an issue with any item that it is that is in a conforming amendment or a change to a conforming amendment, uh, there'll be a, a mechanism to email the staff uh, of your thoughts on that. So that is how we're going to uh, handle conforming men amendments. I think that would is a, a more efficient use of time. And, um, and so that is what we're going to do going forward. So today, wow, we have a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, less complex entities. We're going to talk about auditor reporting. We're going to talk about um, complexity, understandability, scalability, and proportionality. I'm glad I was able to say that all. And then finally, we're going to wrap it up with fraud in a discussion on cybersecurity with the closed session. So, so that is our plan. We have a somewhat an ambitious plan here. Um, but I'm going to kick it off with the LCE and uh, Kai. Morton is going to give us the overview. Kai, welcome. Thank you, Thank you uh, Jim, and uh, welcome to all. Good evening, good afternoon, or good morning for some of you, I think, even. Um, as you've seen from the paper sent out, the purpose of or the objective of this item is to provide you with an update of what happened uh, since we last met. We did have uh, I think the last time we spoke or we met about the LC project was in March. So this is to provide an update on what's happened after that. And in the materials that you've uh, been presented, there's also a report back or a, a summary of the items we discussed last time and the comments you received and a report back of what's been, uh, how they've been dealt with in, in the project as such. Um, so Michelle, you can go to the next slide. We met prior to the March meeting, uh, the, the March IWSB meeting, we spent uh, plenty of time discussing at length the, the, um, the draft at that point, uh, good discussions with the board, uh, gotten detailed feedback from them on direction on where to move. Um, that led to us having an additional session in, in May uh, being targeted on two specific topics. Uh, one of those uh, was applicability, as it's been uh, previously called, and what we discussed with you in, in March. Uh, now that's changed to authority, and it's also um, also changed quite a lot from what we had at that point, as you've seen from the papers presented. <clears throat> um, uh, good discussions, and uh, we agreed on the way forward and that uh, we progressed further on for the June meeting. In addition to that, we had uh, focused this discussion on how we should deal with group audits in the um, in the standard and especially in the explanatory memorandum and uh, what kind of questions and how we could get the input needed uh, from the respondents that could help us move forward on that issue, knowing that that's been an issue that's been brought up quite a lot in outreach as uh, uh, an area where there is a mixed views. <clears throat> and then we had the June meeting, uh, which then was the discussion of the final draft. 
we had an extended week of uh, meetings and uh, approved the um, approved the standard for uh, exposure um, mid second week. Um, there were changes done throughout the week, uh, providing based on the feedback provided from the board. Um, and some of the latest changes uh, related uh, around uh, how to deal with uh, um, the risk reporting responsibilities, which is then also we've explained in the outline that you received in the cover note. Um, uh, in addition, in the same timeline, we've done um, some uh, outreach with different stakeholders. Uh, Included in that is also discussions with the uh, uh, the reference group that we had to use throughout the project itself, uh, meetings with NSS and the SMPAG, uh, leading us to then publishing the ED uh, ISO for LC uh, published in July. Um, as you've seen from the papers, it's uh, together with the ED, there is um, some ex extensive explanatory memorandum uh, explaining the decisions made and also include the specific questions uh, that we're asking for feedback on on the exposure itself. Um, uh, those are included in the agenda item F2 in your papers, I believe. In addition to the material in the standard itself and the explanatory memorandum, there's also been uh, published two supplemental guides. One is around authority, uh, and the second one is around uh, reporting. Um, and in addition to that, we've also um, published a mapping documents that provide an, uh, um, a mapping from the ISO requirements to the requirements in the ISO for LC itself. <coughs> we've also then included uh, when we published this, an optional response template to make it easier for respondents to point out to the, the questions they would like to respond to, which is, an, as I said, an optional response uh, template um, to help them move forward. So, could you go to, go to the next slide, Michelle? Some of the key areas where we're asking for feedback uh, on the EED uh, are listed on this slide, uh, four major areas. Um, there are, I think in total, uh, we have about 25 questions. Um, what we have here uh, are some of the more significant areas where, um, where we still need uh, feedback uh, in order to finalize the standard. And on, as you see here, um, some of the details we would like to hear our views on the standard itself and the content. That's, uh, uh, that would also then include what is included in the standard. Um, uh, and also if there is nothing, or if, if, it, if there's something that's not included, we need to hear that as well. And, but also if there's something that is included, but it's not appropriate for the LC. Um, we also need to uh, hear if it's appropriate, the standard is appropriate for the types of audits that it's been designed for and whether the standard can and will be used. Um, some more detailed feed also, feedback also around the flow and structure of the standard could be helpful for us, uh, as well as some uh, feedback on the title itself, the proposed title of the standard. Um, uh, <coughs> As you know, the authority uh, we've been discussing at length. So I think that's a, uh, an area where we will get uh, quite a lot of input uh, on the uh, exposure, but uh, that's uh, as well an area where we need to hear, um, hear whether or not what, the way that we've uh, dealt with it is uh, usable and also understandable for, um, for the audience. Um, and so who can use the standard and who is it designed for? Uh, we would also like to hear from the relevant standard setting bodies uh, that can do additions to the authority, uh, whether uh, they uh, understand the approach and uh, um, can move forward with that. Um, it's understandable and workable. Um, and also if there's any obstacles in, in how to, um, to adopt the standard itself. So I said, Earlier group audits been been one of the other areas where we had quite a lot of discussion. 
Um, as you know, where we ended up is that group audits is excluded from the standard, uh, but there is quite a lot of uh, material around it explaining um, the reasons why, but also uh, asking for input, whether it's uh, you agree on group audit should be included or not in the standard, and also how, um, if it is to be included, how that could be done so that we get the feedback and um, can move forward with the standard itself. Um, lastly, on this slide, we, we also then would need some feedback, uh, whether if there is any um, additional implementation guidance or transition guidance that would be useful to roll out the standard, um, including also if there's any expected challenges or barriers to the implementation is, itself. As I said, this is only uh, and, uh, some of the questions that are there. Um, so uh, we hope that we get feedback uh, on uh, most of it as well as it's, uh, it will be very helpful for us uh, to uh, finalizing uh, a standard mm -hmm. going forward. Do you want to go to the next slide, Michelle? Um, as you've seen, the deadline for comments is January 31st, 2022, which is then uh, um, from when this was published a little over six months. Um, our traditional um, um, comment period is usually three months, but this, as this being something new and extensive and also reaching out to an audience where we normally don't hear, it's been extended to a little over six months. Um, also, some of the reason for that is that we need to do some quite a lot of extensive and extent, extensive outreach. So if you go to the next slide, Michelle, we can I'll show you a little bit about what we're doing there. Um, when we published the exposure draft and the explanatory memorandum, um, that is also then being translated into Spanish and French. Um, but we also have uh, published video uh, in English, Spanish, and French, a highline, highlights of the stand itself and how it's been developed. Um, as I said, we need to do um, outreach to encourage uh, responses from different stakeholders. Um, but, uh, to do that, we have organized uh, some regional events, including roundtables. Um, you may have also seen that the uh, I think it was last week or the week before there was, uh, we published an, um, an <coughs> outreach plan uh, of events that were planned at that time. Um, I know that there are events uh, being added on as we go. So that's uh, uh, where you can see what will be done <coughs> of outreach. Um, as I said, we will we already have a video in English, Spanish, and French uh, on the standard that we publish at the same same time as the ED and explanatory memorandum, and we also uh, expect to publish further um, videos and social media throughout the consultation period. Um, that may also include LinkedIn live sessions of discussions on specific topics uh, of the standard itself. Um, so there, there 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 is more coming there. Uh, in addition, there's also uh, there will be a released a survey um, that will help uh, help uh, to give feedback, um, and there are also press releases, article, and communiques that have been uh, released and further will be added on as well. So the objective of all of this is to try to get the feedback from a wide range of stakeholders, including the ones that typically don't respond. Um, um, we need to hear from as many as possible on this as well. So, so the, the key here is to, to get, get the input so that we get the feedback on how to further progress uh, to finalize the standard. Thank you. I think that was the last slide that I had. So uh, uh, I can hand back to you, James. Thank you, Kai. And, and just to remind everyone on the CAG, this particular session was designed to be uh, an, really just an update on where the project was because you, you've, made, you've made progress. Uh, so it wasn't meant to, for a full discussion, but just so everyone knew. It does seem like the, the, 
it, one of the big issues is w whether or not to include the group audits um, as a component. I know we've had some discussion at the um, at the CAG level on that issue, as well as uh, a couple of others. But I will entertain uh, briefly here if anyone has any additional comments they'd like to add. Uh, we can do that. Is that okay, Kai, with you? Paul, do you have a, a particular comment? Uh, James, only to say, you know, I don't have, as you say, it's not really appropriate to make any substantive remarks at this point. I just wanted to, to express, again, support for the, for the project. Glad to see the exposure draft is, is now out there. Uh, pleased to see there's quite an extended uh, out uh, period for consultation and very welcome to see an extensive and robust outreach um, program lined up and, and the European Federation of Accountants and Auditors. We're hopeful that we can work with our uh, partners here in Europe, Accountancy Europe in particular, to perhaps put on a regional event in, in Europe as well. Um, so a good job, as you said, Kai, this is an audience, SMPs and SMEs, that you don't often hear from for a variety of reasons. And uh, on this occasion, it is important that we go out and get input from them. So we look forward to helping you in doing that. Thank you, Paul. Speaking of SMEs, Don. <laughs> Thanks. I just want my congratulations on getting the ED out. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a, a long road, but very worthwhile and uh, job well done. So my thanks. And I think I'll close that by echoing that, that comment because uh, this, while it's been discussed for a long time, the actual developing of this was done in, and it seems like relatively quick order. So I know there's a number of CAG members, including myself who appreciate the effort and it's gonna be very interesting to see what the community says on this particular standard. So thank you, Kai, for the presentation. And I am confident you'll be hearing from us again. All right, Michelle, I guess we'll have another one to, to set up. And this is the auditor reporting post implementation review. And this is also designed to be an update of uh, where we are on the post implementation review or where the IWSB is on that. And uh, I think it's um, important that in some of these standards, particularly some of the, the, the larger standards that there is some sort of review mechanism that's, that's done to see if they're actually working. So. Dan, are you ready? I am, Jim, thank you. It's all yours. All right. Uh, well, uh, it's great to be with the, the CAG. Always appreciate the time, uh, and particularly the time to, to update you on the post-implementation review of the auditor reporting standards. Uh, this uh, encompassed uh, all of the, the auditor reporting standards that were issued back uh, in uh, early 2015, uh, as well as the, the, the revised standard on other information that was issued uh, shortly after that in, in April of, of 2015. So uh, the goal of the session today is just to update you on the uh, activities uh, related to the post-implementation review, as, along with the, the recommendations of the working group that will be discussed with the IAASB next week. And um, this is uh, with the intent of bringing closure to the, the post-implementation review. Uh, the, the only materials uh, presented to the CAG were uh, these slides. So I will uh, take, uh, take them as read and only touch on a few key points. Well, Michelle, if we could go to the next slide, please. The uh, objectives of the post-implementation review broadly uh, were to uh, determine whether the IAASB had met the objectives it set out to achieve 
uh, when those standards were issued. And uh, of course that involved determining whether the standards were being consistently understood and implemented uh, across the globe, uh, identifying any practical challenges or concerns that had been uh, uh, raised as a part of the implementation and how those were being addressed. And then uh, finally, looking at uh, the extent of global demand for additional information that might be included in the auditor's report uh, or wider application of those uh, uh, conditional requirements uh, or uh, differential requirements that are now uh, applying only to audits of uh, financial statements for listed entities. The next slide, Michelle. Uh, quickly on the timeline, uh, the IAASB committed to this post-implementation review at the time that the auditor reporting uh, standards were issued. And uh, the, the process really commenced in earnest in uh, December of 2019 uh, with a, a short survey to, uh, to understand the, uh, the global implementation and then uh, picked up additional steam, uh, steam uh, early in, in this year uh, or late in, in 2020 um, with the, uh, uh, the survey and then ultimately the uh, dis discussion with the board in February of this year and now the plan to uh, discuss the recommendations with the board at the, the meeting next week. Next slide. A little bit about the information gathering activities that uh, the working group and staff had followed. Uh, this included a number of different sources, including a, a review of academic research and other available literature relating to these uh, revised auditor reporting standards. Uh, we uh, were able to participate uh, as part of the virtual roundtable that was uh, uh, hosted by the, uh, the IAASB for the Going Concern and Fraud Projects uh, and uh, talked a little bit about uh, with those stakeholder groups about the, the auditor reporting standards. Uh, of course, the, uh, one of the main vehicles was the, the, the stakeholder survey, which I'll talk about a little bit more here in a moment. And then uh, some other information uh, gathering activities, including some uh, direct outreach and discussions with national standard centers and others. The next slide. Uh, the, the survey, uh, 148 uh, responses from uh, a number of different stakeholder groups across the world. Uh, about 70% of the responses came from practitioners, uh, national standard setters, or professional accountancy organizations. Uh, but the good news here is that on the positive side, uh, there were a good number of responses from uh, other stakeholder groups, including investors and users, uh, preparers, and, and those charged with governance. And there was uh, good geographic coverage as well. The next slide. Uh, in, in terms of the findings, uh, the, the key overall findings that came out of this process, uh, there was uh, broad support for the enhancements made, uh, it, including, for example, for uh, the communication of key audit matters, uh, for some of the, the changes to the form and structure of the auditor's report. Uh, but as uh, might be expected, there were a number of implementation challenges that had been uh, identified, and uh, th those will come through as, uh, as, as we'll see as part of the, the recommendations of the working group. Um, one uh, key finding was that uh, with respect to additional information uh, in the auditor's report or, or extending requirements, uh, the message was that more time and information is needed, that some jurisdictions, including some major jurisdictions around the world, uh, auditor reporting is, uh, is still fairly new, uh, these, these changes, uh, the enhanced auditor's report. Uh, or just coming online. So uh, uh, stakeholders said uh, we need a little bit more time to uh, absorb that and understand uh, the demand for, for any additional information. Uh, but of course, across the board, stakeholders basically said uh, there was support for this enhanced type reporting and continued engagement by all stakeholders uh, in, in the public interest 
in terms of uh, uh, enhanced reporting. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, the, the working group's uh, process and approach to developing the recommendations, of course, was to uh, consider the, the feedback that was received from all of the, uh, the information gathering sources, including the, uh, the survey, uh, to uh, uh, keep in mind how any proposed actions relating uh, re would relate to the IAASB's framework for activities and of course to its uh, current and future work plans. And then uh, some important messages from, uh, or cautions from stakeholders basically to uh, uh, make sure that there was uh, time to consider more implementation experiences as I noted, and also uh, to keep in mind that uh, if there are any revisions to keep those to targeted improvements rather than uh, lengthy projects, as there are a number of uh, recent standards that are still being uh, absorbed uh, by those stakeholders. So Michelle, if you could go to the next slide, uh, we're getting into the, the recommendations themselves. There were uh, nine of them in total, some of them were specific to key themes that were identified uh, from the information gathering process. Uh, others were more general in nature and cut across uh, the, the different themes. And uh, some of them are uh, a bit interrelated. Uh, the, the first recommendation relates to, to key audit matters. And uh, uh, essentially the message from, uh, from the post-implementation review was uh, that there was broad support across stakeholder groups uh, for the, uh, the value of the communication of key audit matters. And that was particularly highlighted by investors who uh, found CAM to uh, provide greater transparency and uh, increased confidence uh, that the auditor was focusing on uh, the areas most likely uh, to have greater risk of, of material misstatement. Uh, of course, there, there were some concerns that were noted, uh, including uh, keeping CAM fresh year, year over year, making CAM entity specific and avoiding boilerplate, and uh, some calls for, uh, for some additional information on outcomes or observations from the procedures performed in those areas relating to the, the key audit matters. Um, there was also uh, support uh, fairly broad support uh, for extending uh, key audit matters or the communication to uh, public interest entities and not just uh, to listed entities. Uh, also comments though that uh, that should be a jurisdictional decision. Uh, the working group uh, on that last matter basically noted that uh, the IAASB's PI work stream uh, would be considering this and uh, would be in the, the best position to, to have a further look at that particular point. Um, going concern, of course, was a topic of great interest to, to stakeholders, particularly in the current environment. Uh, the, the working group uh, acknowledged that uh, the IAASB's going concern uh, work stream would be considering uh, or exploring further actions uh, in this area. So uh, the recommendation is to, to provide input and support as needed. Uh, to that uh, working group. Uh, on ISO 720 revised, the standard on uh, other information, this was perhaps the area where there uh, were the most implementation challenges that were noted. Uh, essen uh, essentially questions have arisen since that standard was issued in April of 2015, uh, relating to things like the, the length and complexity of, of that section of the auditor's report, uh, clarity about whether the auditor's opinion extends to other information, uh, and challenges uh, with, the, with the scope, uh, including some ambiguity uh, by some uh, about the definition of, of an annual report, which uh, dictates the, the, uh, the auditor's work effort uh, and, and the other information to be included. Uh, the, the working group noted that some of these challenges have already been addressed by national standard setters through, uh, through guidance issued at, at the local level. Uh, but the, uh, the working group came to the conclusion that uh, uh, additional guidance might be helpful uh, through updated FA, uh, uh, FAQs, frequently asked questions, uh, but uh, questioned whether 
uh, non-authoritative guidance alone uh, may be sufficient to address the issues that had been identified. So the uh, uh, the working group uh, re recommended uh, perhaps the consideration of targeted revisions as part of the IAASB's uh, future work plan. And if you recall the discussion uh, uh, from yesterday, that is included as a possibility in the, the draft work plan that will be discussed uh, with the board next week. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, there was an issue that uh, had uh, has it, it, its roots back in the uh, the inf invitation to comment uh, in uh, December of 2015 that uh, set the stage for the the quality management project, and that related to uh, situations when an individual other than the engagement partner signs the auditor's report. Uh, that issue was uh, discussed by the board as part of the revision to ISA 220. And uh, the board concluded at that time that uh, further expl exploration was needed uh, about the, the circumstances and, and what was being done. Uh, so in that regard, uh, the, uh, uh, the New Zealand uh, board uh, was kind enough to undertake a, a survey uh, of experiences. Uh, and uh, had a fairly good response to, to that survey. And, and essentially what the survey found was that this is an issue that exists in, uh, in several jurisdictions uh, and practice varies in terms of uh, uh, what the, is required uh, by the, uh, uh, it, uh, required by the, uh, the individual signing the report uh, in order to, to be in a position to, uh, to, to undertake that signing. So the, the working group uh, uh, concluded that uh, some uh, guidance would be helpful in this regard, and uh, that uh, can be discussed by the board uh, and, and also to determine uh, the uh, uh, responsibility for the, the development of, of that guidance. Uh, in terms of additional information in the auditor's report, there, were, there was some uh, feedback about uh, the need for uh, additional transparency about certain matters, uh, the matters that come up most often, uh, materiality, uh, communication about the audit scope and approach, uh, certainly going concern was mentioned, uh, as I noted before, and uh, some additional uh, communication about fraud. Uh, a number of, uh, or a couple of uh, other matters, but uh, but not as much as uh, the ones I just mentioned. Uh, in that regard, the the working group's conclusion was that uh, should continue to monitor global developments, uh, just to to fully understand the demand, and of course noting that uh, going concern and, and the fraud work streams also uh, uh, may be considering uh, 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 matters relating to transparency in the auditor's report. Uh, with respect to other assurance reports, uh, and uh, there was some demand for aligning the structure of those reports with the auditor's report. Uh, for example, to put the opinion or conclusion first, uh, followed by the basis for opinion and conclusion, uh, perhaps consider an independent statement, uh, thing, things along those lines. Most of the comments in this area uh, related to uh, ISRE 2410, uh, with respect to interim reviews of uh, financial statements. And uh, there was uh, probably more uh, uh, demand for alignment in that area because uh, uh, 2410 is more closely related to the audits of financial statements. And one uh, issue in particular related to, to going concern and uh, the uh, perceived inconsistency in the way uh, going concern is treated in the interim report, interim review reports compared to the full year uh, audited uh, financial statements. And uh, uh, believe that's something that's also on the, uh, the going concern work stream radar screen as, uh, as well as 2410 was mentioned uh, in the draft work plan as well. Uh, then uh, next slide, Michelle. The, uh, uh, the, the last recommendations uh, basically are, uh, are, are more broad in nature. Uh, when I, if I mentioned uh, non-authoritative guidance in, in several areas, uh, the, uh, the working group believed that the best and most effective way to do that was to update the existing auditor reporting frequently asked questions, 
Um, obviously, then continuing to provide support to, to other uh, IAASB working groups and to continue the ongoing engagement with, uh, with stakeholders. Uh, the next slide. This uh, I, I won't spend any time on. It's, it's basically just a, a visual depiction of the, the, uh, the link between the recommendations and uh, for the key themes and uh, the, uh, the IAASB's uh, framework for activities. Just a, a, a nice handy summary. Uh, so the last slide, please. Uh, and uh, importantly, on, on the way forward, uh, the, uh, with the discussion next week with the board, uh, the, uh, uh, the post-implementation review would now be completed. Uh, the, the working group has a, a couple of remaining uh, tasks uh, in terms of providing input to, to the other work streams, uh, updating the, the FI, FAQs, as I mentioned, and then uh, perhaps looking at a, a publication, whether it's a staff publication uh, or some other type of non-authoritative guidance on uh, the signing partner matter. And of course, uh, important to note that, that any uh, future decisions uh, made would be uh, part of the, the work plan decisions uh, and uh, through the, the framework for activities. And that will all be part of the discussion next week uh, on this topic, as well as the, uh, the board's discussion on the, uh, on the proposed work plan. Uh, so Jim, that's, uh, that's all that I have. And uh, if there's any remaining time, we'll turn it back and, and see if there are any particular uh, comments or reactions. Uh, Dan, I see you got quite a bit of good information here during your research or during your feedback sessions. And one thing that seems to resonate um, based on your slides is a lot of people want some sort of post-implementation guidance. And I wonder if some of the larger standards like that um, call for, for something like that uh, from to be written. Well, all I would say, Jim, is that um, th there, there always are calls for, uh, for additional guidance, um, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you, know, uh, you know, immediately after a, a standard has been issued or, or down the line to address uh, uh, additional implementation challenges or, or questions. And uh, that that's a that's a matter that the the, the board would would uh, would need to consider. I don't know if if Philly would want to come in and and uh, make any further comments uh, about that. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, and and Jim, you're quite right. You know, when we look at our framework for activities uh, um, as part of our category A, we that's so, that's uh, I think Beth described it yesterday. That's our that's our big pot of all possible topics that may arise at some point to become an IWSB project. Part of what feeds into those possible topics would be post-implementation reviews. Um, they obviously need to be undertaken in a very targeted fashion because they obviously consume resources. Uh, but I think in the case of some of the big standards that have big impact, uh, they are fully justified. And um, we also just need to uh, realize that you need to give sufficient implementation also uh, for those uh, for all the issues to actually work through the system before you get real value out of the post implementation review. But you're quite right; that's certainly a tool in our toolbox, and we will continue to um, use it as appropriate in the circumstances. Thank you, Billy uh, Galen. Um, yeah, and, and thank you so much, Dan, for that summary update. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, and I recognize that you're talking about post-implementation. thought I'd try to take advantage of the opportunity having you on the line here, uh, looking forward a, a little bit, because it seems like we've had a lot of discussion about non-financial uh, information being reported or wanting to be reported in the future. And in particular, the CAG has been talking about uh, what, what it's seen coming down the road on ESG, for example. Where do you see that fitting in? Do you see that as an integrated sort of, sort of reporting activity or, or being separate from it? Is, 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 are you thinking about it in terms of other information 
or is it just simply not non-financial information that doesn't have anything to do with the, the financial statements per se, or is it going to be something that transitions in steps and ultimately, maybe we don't know today, but five or six years from now, it'll, it'll work its way out. Do you have any thoughts on that, Dan? Uh, thanks, Galen. And I think all I would say about that is that, uh, uh, again, when the auditor reporting standards were issued there, even at that time, there was some discussion about uh, the, uh, uh, the, the need for, for more communication about non-financial information. Uh, things have certainly evolved since that time. And I know uh, the IAASB, as you mentioned, is, uh, is, is is, is looking at, at that area be, uh, in view of uh, some of the, the recent developments. Uh, and, and I would again have to defer to, to Billy to, to come in and, and perhaps say a, a, a few more words about uh, that, that whole area. Yeah, I think, um, uh, Dan, thank you very much. Let me just see what's going on here. Okay. Um, I think Galen, you know, that's a that's a very prominent, uh, that, that's a very important question. I think we're seeing that more and more um, as all the developments around ESG and so on take place as well. The one the one thing that we we are really uh, concerned about from an IWSB perspective, and I think Tom touched on this yesterday as well, um, is the risk of conflation. You know, there is a real risk that if we try to start um, um, backfilling ESG information. Um, and with that, I'm not disputing the importance of the ESG information, but I do think there is sense in keeping um, that that sustainability ESG type reporting separate from the core reporting on financial uh, on financial statements, which obviously still and will continue to play a critical role in the financial stability of markets. And I think you need to be careful not to conflate the two. Um, so when you talk about 720, remember, there's always a risk that if you start mentioning that together with ESG reporting, that people may think they get a level of assurance from the work that the auditor necessarily has to done, uh, uh, necessarily has to do in terms of the other information. But that's for a completely different purpose. That is in the context of the audit of the financial statements, which is a very specific um, subject matter information. So I do think that as this evolves, and I think we see it in some of the policy discussions that uh, take place already, is that your sustainability reporting becomes part of the package, but we shouldn't conflate the two things in within the package. And when there's a need for assurance around that aspect of the external reporting, um, as that matures, as, um, 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 as that becomes regulated, as that becomes mandated, uh, the need for assurance will arise. And then I think there's a legitimate um, um, ask for an assurance service over that. But still, I do think that that needs to be separated out from the audit of the financial statements. And we need to address that risk of conflation so that we don't confuse two very um, unique sets of subject matter information uh, where the needs of the users may also be quite different in the context of those um, different subject matter information. So I, I do see a role, maybe going directly to your point, that um, the assurance engagements in that space will develop together with the assurance reports that go with that. Willie, I, I happen to agree with you, but there are, I, I'm, I'm hearing even in the call, I believe it was either yesterday or the day before, some people talking about integrated reporting. We'll just have to see what happens, I suppose. Okay. Yeah, that's in, great. in the interest of time, because I know we're over, uh, Paul, do you have a quick question? Uh, yeah, I promise, James, it's a quick one. Um, Dan, is there any evidence as to the voluntary take-up of um, by um, unlisted companies of the CAM reporting? For, for, uh, for, for non-listed, Paul? Yeah, for non-listed. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I really don't recall that there was much evidence in the, the information gathering, including the survey, uh, to indicate uh, that, that there was uh, uh, you know, take up uh, uh, or, or voluntary communication of, of CAM by, by uh, uh, non-listed entities. Uh, certainly, if there is, it, it is not uh, uh, broad at this, point, at this point. 
Thanks, Dan. Chris, uh, Christian. Thanks, Jim. Uh, just in the interest of time, uh, so what I want to uh, highlight is the audit opinion as it is, is an overall opinion on the financial statements. And I think there's a risk that we can start piecemealing, providing opinion on separate bits and pieces, uh, which we should really keep an eye on. Um, and to your point, Galen, this is why I was mentioning this. We do see in Europe some countries have coming up with different requirements, uh, either uh, opining on the existence of, of certain information or on uh, uh, the information itself being part of uh, uh, information being audited or being part of being reviewed, but also with, uh, sometimes with reference outside to other information. So I think this is really something uh, where we have to keep an eye on uh, to ensure that we uh, remain consistent throughout the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, maybe they'll have to look into the, the public sector where they have other information uh, and how that's done. Okay, so I will conclude. Thank you, Dan. Uh, great to hear the update. And I, I think it's really good to have these uh, post-implementation reviews because you can see you know, after the fact where, where things stand. So thank you for coming to the CAG and your time there. And with that, we have earned a break. Um, oh, no, we have not. I take that back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we, we actually will continue on and do uh, complexity, complexity, understandability, scalability, and proportionality. I'm not sure whether you call it CUSP or, or CUSIB. What is the official title of, of this section? We'll call it CUSP, uh, James, but you've done well, very well uh, pronouncing it twice now, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger. It's all yours. Thank you. If we can bring the slides up, thanks. And looking forward to getting the feedback uh, uh, from, from the CAG. Uh, this is the first time that we've presented this particular project uh, to you. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit of background while these slides are coming up. Um, the This is a basically a companion project to the... Um, to the standard on less complex entities. Uh, so when we got the feedback, uh, we got feedback that it would be good to develop a separate standard uh, for the less complex entities, but we also had to deal with the issues of uh, complexity, uh, uh, understandability, scalability, and proportionality uh, within the suite of standards. Uh, so this is our, our approach as to how we're dealing within the suite of standards. You have the slides, I'll take those as read, but I'll work you through them. And then I'm looking forward to getting any feedback on this particular project. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so the respondents feedback in relation to CUSP, and most of this was in was due to the, um, the uh, discussion paper that we put out on audits of less complex entities. And within the suite of ICES, uh, there was concerns raised around uh, the, the increasing length and volume uh, of the standards. We had just put out uh, ISA 315, ISA 540. Uh, both of those standards had seen a considerable length, length and increase in, in volume and, and people saw it as complex language. There was also concern about the fact that the standards were becoming more prescriptive in their nature and moving away from a principles base uh, and, that, uh, and that there were issues being raised about uh, scalability of the standards and, and the proportionality of our responses to the issues that were being raised. Uh, documentation uh, was uh, raised consistently as an, as, as an issue. We realise that the complexity in the environment that we're dealing with is not just related to the auditing standards. Uh, and so a lot of the complexity which was being arisen was basically due to subject matter, um, the accounting standards becoming much more complex in this particular area uh, and regulatory pressure. So there are things that we can deal with uh, and there are things that are outside our domain, uh, but we recognise just part of the day-to-day -day operations. Next slide, please. So we're putting together, as, as far as dealing with the suite of ICES, 
um, our approach is to uh, come up with drafting principles and guide guidelines, which relate to when you are drafting ICES. Uh, so this is the primary action to address the cusp across the suite of ICES. Um, the aim of these drafting principles and guidelines is to provide a common understanding about how the ICES are drafted, to take out of the discussion uh, issues when we're discussing these standards as to whether or not we've drafted them, what the words mean, etc. We can refer to this particular set of principles and guidelines to promote consistency, clarity and uniformity, um, to ensure that we've got a reflective mindset that we're actually achieving what we are intending to achieve while we're drafting and to get a more consistent and effective application of the ICES uh, with the focus in this particular area on how the ICES are written and presented. We have presented the draft guidelines to the board, strong support. Um, the board sees it as useful for enhancing the consistency and effective application, and they did see it as serving the public interest. We've also presented it to the national standard setters who are very interested in this particular project, and again, strong support from the national standard setters. Uh, next slide, please. So the drafting principles and guidelines are intended for primary use by the staff who are drafting the standards. Um, we recognise, so it is a, a set of uh, principles and guidelines that they refer to as they're going through the drafting. Uh, we understand that they're operating under the direction of the board uh, and the task force in that particular areas. Uh, and so the board and task force will be involved. It, it is not limited in use to those. We understand the use for others, especially for the national standard setters who are also drafting standards or revising the standards that they will pick up these particular areas. Translators who have had some difficulties in translating our standards uh, in that particular area. Uh, so it's applied in the context of the ICES. It may be also useful to the ISREs, the ISAEs. They are slightly different in concept and format, uh, but the principles and guidelines should come across. Very closely, we're working with the ED on the ISIS for LCE to see what we can learn on drafting with them. And they are looking very closely at what we have produced uh, as they've produced that ED. So there is a very close uh, relationship, uh, including staff uh, involved uh, and and uh, and board members involved on both of those particular task forces. Next slide, please. Uh, so it's been developed by the CUSP working group on the basis. So this is how we've developed. This is the basis on which we've developed it. Um, the the IAASB did work through a clarity project um, back over about ten years ago. Uh, and we have picked up the clarity drafting conventions from, from that particular time. Uh, and, and because sometimes we have potentially just moved away from those particular clarity drafting conventions. Um, we have uh, looked at staff training materials uh, and any internal thinking on drafting matters. A lot of times drafting matters have been raised. So how has that been discussed and how has that been resolved? Um, enhanced presentation tools within the standards, such as boxing, uh, such as uh, other ways of highlighting particular areas of interest. ISA 315, which got a lot of discussion at the board, um, uh, was, uh, was one of the standards which drove a little bit of the enhanced presentation. Scalability and proportionality changes within the recent revised ISAs we continually get the feedback on have on scalability of the standards uh, and the and whether the standards are proportional to the user user needs. So looking at how those things have been uh, addressed um, and and information provided by national standard setters who are, who work through very closely on the drafting uh, when they receive the standards. Uh, we have ran through uh, also uh, staff and we've got feedback from the IAASB staff uh, while we've been developing these particular guidelines. Next slide, please. So this is a non-authoritative 
and living document. Uh, so it is expected that staff, when they're drafting, uh, will follow these principles. It is, they are principles. They are not requirements. And so there may be deviations and there may be a good reason for those deviations. In the first place, those deviations will be discussed with senior staff. And the deviations, there will be board engagement for, uh, when there are deviations through the issues papers. So we will highlight when there are some deviations and the reason for those deviations so the board fully understands it. Uh, we'll also, as a living document, it will be updated as we get feedback in that particular area. The proposed approach to apply these standards is the staff's initial assessment is to apply them on a going forward basis. So they'll be applied to new, new ISA development. Uh, so the, the, the staff recognise that uh, a retrospective analysis and a new, uh, and a new clarity project uh, with everything on the board's agenda at the moment uh, would consume a lot of board time. There will be outreach program, uh, uh, which will include uh, whether they should be applied. So we will ask those questions as to how we deal with those particular areas and that we'll bring that feedback uh, back to the staff. But that's the staff's initial assessment applied going forward. Next slide, please. Next slide. So going forward, we're having problems going forward. So, um, um, I think it's uh, frozen. So just yes. Let me just talk to it, uh, Michelle, because uh, we're we're just about there, um, and uh, I'm very keen to hear from from the board. So the way forward for us is that we are going to undertake targeted outreach. Uh, so we have identified people who work closely with the standards. We'll get their feedback. Uh, we are progressing that over the next month. Uh, we are also producing uh, some high level non-authoritative guidance on documentation. Uh, we recognize that documentation is a specific issue. People are asking, you know, how much do I need to document uh, within my working papers? Um, there is very close coordination with the LCE task force, as I've talked about, this complex entities task force. Uh, and the feedback from ISIS for LCEs is due in January. We will continue to work with those. And the expectation is that we will finalise in Q1 2022 uh, that particular area. Um, so the outreach is targeted to people who have expertise. Uh, and we'll also look at making sure that everybody is included. There is a chance for all people uh, from a public interest area, all people included in that particular area. Uh, so that gives you some ideas uh, at a high level as to what's involved in the drafting principles and guidelines. Uh, Jim, I'd like to then turn it back to you. I'm looking for any feedback, any views uh, that will uh, on this particular area, uh, which will help us improve how the ISAs are addressing the cusp area. So if I can turn it back to you to get some feedback, and that's what we're up to, the matters for consideration. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'd love to get some feedback from the board. First time we've presented this to the CAG. Great. Thanks, Roger. And I think of over the years, the one consistent um, feedback has been relative to complexity of the, the writing and the standards. So I, I, I think that many of the CAG members are probably very happy to see that you've been brave enough to take on this task and, uh, and see if we can come up with some, some uh, solutions here. Paul, do you have a comment? Uh, I do, Jim. Thanks, uh, Roger, for the presentation. Um, <coughs> Before I can really evaluate 
the uh, success of this strategy, I, I'm, I kind of keep going back and am trying to figure out what the objective is that the board is trying to achieve here. <clears throat> and and, it, and your uh, reference back to the Clarity Project is, is part of what uh, I think intrigued me. Because uh, I was thinking about it, there are, I think, four possible objectives that the board thinks might need to be addressed. And I guess I'd be curious in your reaction to which of these four you think is the underlying motivation. Uh, one possibility is that the board has concluded that the principles embedded in the Clarity Project were misguided and therefore need to be rethought. Second possibility is that the board and staff, while the Clarity Principles are still valid, the board and staff have nevertheless migrated away from the away from the clarity principles over the last 10 years or so and therefore need some kind of a regrounding a uh, third possibility would be the clarity principles are still working reasonably well but this is a part of continuous improvement which we we always want to do or the fourth possibility i think is that this could be a response to a constituency that effectively wants a Cliff Notes version of the standards. And I guess I'd really like to better understand what the board's underlying objective is. And, and maybe there's a fifth possibility I haven't thought of. I don't know. But uh, which of those you think is most closely uh, representative of the board's starting point? Because that would really help me as I'm thinking about the, the uh, materials that you put together and the, the, the path to success, I think, is better understanding the objective the board is trying to achieve. Thank you. Roger, would you like to take that one or would you like me to take more questions? Look, I, I think I'll take that one because it's a very specific question, um, uh, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, Paul. Um, look, I, I'll, re I'll refer you to back to um, uh, the, the cover paper and uh, paragraph three of the cover paper where we outline what we're trying to do in that particular area. Um, the, it, it's certainly, uh, you know, as you outlined it, uh, it's certainly not one, but the board has worked through very carefully uh, as to what we're trying to achieve in this particular project. And that took quite a lot of time in the setup in that, in that particular area. Uh, we, we don't believe the clarity uh, principles are broken. Uh, but we, it is easy to lose reference to them 10 years later. Can they be enhanced? Yes, they can possibly be enhanced, and we can work through that particular area. Uh, so, uh, but uh, if I can just refer you back to that as a, as a starting point as it goes, but thank you very much for the feedback uh, and, and take it on board. Uh, in fact, it's, it's, it was good to see as we work through, and we've got further to work through, is the clarity principles have stood up pretty well over time, uh, and uh, so that's been uh, that's been beneficial. But we can always test ourselves through a continual enhancement process. Thank you, Roger. That um, uh, sorry, that's very helpful because I think what that tells me is, as you say, you think the clarity principles still work, but always need to go back and check that you're still grounded in them and look for opportunities for improvement. Is is, is I think at the core of what you're describing to me, which is, is very helpful for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. All right, we have some uh, additional hands. Uh, Hilda. Thank you very much and good day to all. Um, and thank you very much for, for the presentation and for the additional clarity. Um, we, um, we thought that the principle or the objective here was very simple to increase or to improve, uh, you know, the cusp, all of them. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very supportive of those objectives. Um, we have some mixed reactions, though, on uh, what is being presented to us today. And um, it's especially related to the scalability and the proportionality. And um, it's basically seen as um, confirming where we are on that now, but not trying to move that on to respond to the concerns, which we think at least led to having the ISA on the less complex entities. Uh, so to 
uh, almost have what we would call a building block approach so that, uh, you know, in the future, ideally, uh, you would not need uh, an ISA for LCEs and maybe others, uh, but that this would really be uh, via a building block approach be uh, uh, taken care of in the ISAs itself. Uh, on the other part of it, complexity and understandability, uh, we got quite a lot of positive uh, reactions. So uh, that was really uh, very much appreciated how this was uh, laid out, uh, you know, plainer English, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs. Um, so those type of things were seen as, as very helpful, not only in English, but also when uh, standards are uh, being translated. Um, that there was an additional uh, consideration added to that, that, uh, you know, this is basic, basically mainly for the staff uh, drafting the standards. Uh, that's, that's great. Uh, but in order to really implement this, or should we say enforce this, uh, you need pretty strong leadership in order to have uh, volunteers, members in boards, in, in working groups to actually uh, wanting to really abide by this. And there might be exceptions, yes, but that is the, the, the writing guidelines, so to say, the drafting guidelines that you would like to, to stick to. And um, that, that means at times uh, you have to push back very hard on additions that people would like to make because they personally feel strongly about them, but it might not meet the objective of what you really try to uh, achieve in the standards. A final comment, uh, and that's maybe a question, um, as this is kind of the mirror of the LCE uh, uh, ISA project, uh, this is not going out for um, consultation. And uh, some put to us that they were questioning if that was the right due process, uh, not an answer, just a question um, to that. So. Um, with those observations, I hope um, uh, you uh, can give us some further guidelines on that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hilda. We have another hand. Uh, Willie, do you have something specific to Hilda's comment or do you have a general comment? No, um, Gemma, I want to respond um, to some of Hilda's points, but I'm also happy to um, for you to um, get the other input as well before I respond. Okay, Akihito. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your great presentation. It is very helpful. Uh, let me share uh, two short comments. Uh, the first point uh, is, I think that it is important to conduct outreach activities, also considering the ease of uh, translation to other languages and uh, outreach activities uh, also uh, under COVID-19 must be fully conducted using uh, virtual meeting activity. Uh, the second, uh, if the enhanced presentation tool uh, used in ISA 315 revised uh, is adopted, uh, note that uh, the degree of importance uh, should not be misunderstood and uh, there needs to be a clear and uh, consistent definition of when to use uh, a particular format. Thank you. Thank you, Akihito. Hussein. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, presentation. Uh, my, uh, I wanna just, uh, I was wondering, I have one question about uh, when this project complete, uh, all ISAs uh, should be, uh, all ISAs uh, would be reviewed and then if uh, need for uh, clarification or uh, other aspect uh, and then uh, new draft, uh, is there any intention uh, for uh, reviewing all uh, <coughs> ISAs uh, according to uh, these drafting principle. Thank you. Thank you, Hussein. Uh, Tom? Hope you're on mute. Yeah, I got it. So Hussein, I'll talk to you last point there. Um, 
This is not an absolutely determined issue in my mind, but I could give you my personal point of view based upon what I see our priorities are. Uh, my personal point of view is that it would be challenging and not necessarily the best use of the board's time to go back and revise all the standards, but to adopt the, stand, the principles of cost on a go forward basis for the most part um, and take it forward. We have a lot of important standards that are in play, but the risk is, is we just don't have the plenary time or don't want to go through a Clarity 2 project that would just occupy us when there's a lot of major public interest issues, for example, NFI <laughs> coming up and the risk reward uh, uh, of it doesn't play out. You know, I think the risk is, is that uh, uh, ch small changes in wordings can have unintended consequences in the near term when there's a lot of other things going on. So that's my personal point of view. I think that's the general sense of the board, but we have not uh, gone fully forward on it. It doesn't preclude small amendments that where we could clean things up, but that we have not taken a view on. But I don't anticipate a whole scale rewrite of all the ICES writ large. I, I think it more on a on a, a going forward basis. Next time, uh, Billy. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I just wanted to come back to some of the um, important points that Hilda raised. Um, Hilda, firstly, I, I fully acknowledge, I think, you know, now that we've put in the effort uh, to develop the drafting principles and guidelines, it's really up to us now to also really make sure that we abide by them. Um, so I really take your point on board to um, that both from a board perspective and a staff perspective, these should actually now be applied and we should resist the temptation to deviate too much from, from the principles that we've developed. So that point is well taken. Um, just in terms of, um, you know, the extent to which this might or might not be addressing um, um, sustainability and proportionality, uh, sorry, scalability and proportionality, I think was specifically your point, um, and, and not so much uh, maybe the complexity and the understandability part. I do think what is important um, is that Roger um, did refer to it at the beginning that, you know what, this, this came out of the, the public consultation that we did on the um, application of the ISAS to less complex entities. And um, when we got the feedback, we identified that there was a number of issues that do not only relate to LC, uh, LCEs, they, they have a broader application. So I think, you know, you also need to look at these drafting principles and guidelines, not in isolation, but in terms of the full package of the solutions that we're offering. So the drafting principles and guidelines uh, is, as Roger set out, with the aims that the, the aims that we've alluded to. But part of that old entire package is also the fact that we've developed the um, the, the ED for LC, uh, for LCE now, the L, separate LCE standard. Uh, we've got um, the guidance piece that we're developing on documentation that we will be bringing to the board in October. There's the initiative around the uh, digitization of the handbook that will hopefully make the navigation of the standards much easier. We will continue to make sure that in all open and future projects, uh, these CUS principles are incorporated. And, and next week when we discuss ISA 600, part of what ISA, the 600 task force have done um, is to actually coordinate with the CUS working, uh, working group um, on the latest draft that they've, um, uh, the latest draft that they've um, um, sub, uh, developed. And then uh, lastly, is out of this consultation, there were also a number of very specific points um, that were raised in terms of pro possible problem areas in individual standards. And those we've made sure that we captured in our category A of our framework for activities. And um, as those come up um, in terms of importance for future projects, um, all the, uh, this, uh, it will obviously be considered. So it is very important that we also see the total package in response to the feedback that we got from respondents. Um, the last um, aspect that I also just want to address is your question about the process or due process. Um, it is important to just remember that in terms of our uh, terms of reference and our due process, um, that only applies to the um, standard setting board's pronouncements and the pronouncements are defined as the standards, the international standards on auditing, ISREs, ISRSs, 
Um, so this is certainly not a due process project. And that's why we also, we, we, we've deliberated this in, in, on the public record in public session, because we do want to give transparency to it. And we will also uh, publish the drafting principles and guidelines. Uh, but that is why we only undertaking targeted um, uh, targeted outreach for those people that, uh, for those stakeholders that actually are close to standard setting and for which these drafting principles and guidelines may be very useful in terms of a common understanding um, uh, in terms of how the standards are put together. So it's it's not going it's not going through the process as such. Thanks, Billy. Daniel, you've had your hand up. Uh, okay, my colleagues have, uh, have said some very important things, so I just want to put it out that this is a very important project for the region, you know, for Latin America. But as some colleagues have indicated, it is vital to have um, enough guidance because many of, uh, of the SMEs or auditors are from small firms or practice it individually, you know. So they must become familiar with the approach and the scope of the new standard. For this reason, uh, I think it's it's very important to have a quick translation into Spanish, considering that this, uh, this has always been a weakness for the application of vices in Latin America. You, you know that. So uh, I, I really encourage uh, to get uh, that translation as soon as possible in order to to um, help also to the enforcement process in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right, uh, Roger, that was quite a bit of discussion. So I'm gonna turn it back to you uh, to see if you have any comments you'd like to provide. Yeah, um, thank, thanks very much, uh, Jim. Uh, look, uh, great, great comments. We'll take them all on board. Uh, and I think uh, that uh, Tom and Billy have given some uh, some context here. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, pick up uh, one, but, but appreciate everybody's comments, which was Hilda's uh, reference to the building blocks approach. Um, we, we haven't used the words building blocks approach to a large degree. Um, but but it's, it, the concept is 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 live. Um, effectively, the requirements when you have a requirement for an auditing standard, it it, it applies to all audits. Uh, if if there is specific considerations uh, for less complex or more complex entities, uh, so uh, in those particular areas or public sector. Um, what this is saying is make that really clear, make, the, make those considerations very clear uh, so that we can pick those, those areas up. So um, one of the issues with building block approach is, you know, what do you use as your, your starting point at the area? So but the, the area that we're aiming for is make it really clear as to what the requirements are. Um, but uh, great feedback there. Um, the project will be as 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 good as as mentioned uh, uh, as the leadership. Uh, everybody is committed to this particular project, uh, and we will get feedback. I might uh, just see if Brett uh, or Colina had any other comments uh, or, or views, James, uh, Jim, before we finish up. If that's okay, uh, Brett, would you like to come in and just add anything? Uh, thanks, Roger. Uh, nothing from my side, thank you, but a very good discussion and very glad that we got this opportunity to speak to the CAG. Thanks, Brett. Um, and I think Colleen is fine too. So so thank, thanks, Jim. I think, I think that was very, uh, very beneficial. Very much appreciate the opportunity to speak. So Great. thank you for, for, oh, there's our room. Um, thank you for uh, coming to the CAG and, and updating us on are talking to us about this uh, project. So we look forward to, to hearing some more as it develops. Uh, certainly there's been a fair amount of discussion and with the LCE and some of the concepts there, uh, you know, I think there is, there's gonna be continued interest. All right, perfect timing, Roger. Um, we will now uh, take our break and our break will uh, go through 4.30 today. So that's 4.30 Eastern Standard. See everyone in about 10 minutes.
All right, we're going to be gathering everyone back. Lynn, it's good to see you. What hour is it over your neck of the woods? It's uh, um, after four o'clock. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. You talked to Lynn, not me. So, yeah. <laughs> Unless Lynn Jewy, are you doing the fraud presentation today? No, no, no. I'm just listening. Uh, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, no, sorry. Go um, it's eight thirty in the morning, so it's very civilized. Much less oh, civilized for Lynn. Just, just remember that the, the CAG's very civilized to you before you start <laughs> the presentation. So we've had a lot of, uh, a fair amount of just general discussion about fraud over the years within CAG and, and uh, the auditor's responsibility and 240. So I, I think we're very interested in hearing uh, about this project. And Lynn, I will hand it off to you. Um, thank you very much, Jim. I appreciate that. And good morning, everybody. It's nice to be here with you, and I hope you're all well. I've um, read the notes uh, from your March meeting, and many of the topics that you discussed and raised at that meeting, I will cover this morning, because we have... Um, moved on from where we were at that point in time to starting to shape the project proposal. So um, whilst the topics are very similar, we are progressing towards um, the next stage. Can I have the next slide, please? So just to give you a status of where we started and where we're heading, um, you'll remember when you were last briefed the roundtable discussions and other outreach had been completed um, and we had also done some academic research. In fact, we've done significant academic research. Since then, we got the um, responses to the discussion paper and I'll talk about um, what we've heard this morning, and you will have read some of it in the papers provided. And we, were, we have also done some root cause analysis, and I'll come back to that topic. All of that information gathering and research has been put before three board meetings, and there has been rigorous discussion on each topic. You might remember that we were intending to put the pro project proposal to the board in September. Um, we have moved that out to December to give ourselves a little bit more time to consider um, the broad range of feedback we've received and um, to make sure that the um, public interest issues that I'll also talk about this morning are well shaped. So the plan is to put this um, project proposal to the December board meeting for approval. So it's going to be a very busy um, <coughs> December board meeting with 600, the work plan and the fraud project proposal. Next slide, please. Um, we obtained um, clear, obviously I've talked about the um, discussions with the board and the first one was in April. And at the April meeting, we <coughs> heard from um, board members, we, we provided board members with the results of the discussion paper responses. And we also put to them all of the issues, but for discussion, those that were very clear that there was a need for standard setting, and also um, <coughs> a list of the other ones that would be covered in June and July. Um, from the responses, the research, <clears throat> and actually the root cause analysis, 
there are some areas where it is extremely clear that we need to do standard setting. Um, the first one of those is risk assessment, use it in the new 315 and updating 240 to incorporate the ideas and concepts in 315. Um, important <coughs> and it's a part of that, but also on its own, is there was widespread um, <coughs> interest in a strengthening the, the standard to emphasize the real importance and fraud detection of internal controls, tone at the top, and the culture of the organization. So we will be making sure that we strengthen those concepts in our standard setting. Another clear area for um, <clears throat> standard setting is to strengthen the communication with those charged with governance. And that also includes with management and with internal audit, which I know is a topic of conversation in March 21. <clears throat> The other is to strengthen the journal entry testing um, area. So those are clear areas for standard setting and we have almost universal agreement to make that happen. <laughs> the next area um, where there was support for modernization is in technology. This is pretty much a theme across all of our standard setting at present, and it's certainly something we will address with the technology working group and identify whether we, um, what mixture of application material and um, other support material we might use to address technology issues. Um, as I said, though, those are the clearest areas from our feedback. There are a number of other issues, and we subsequently put them to the June board meeting and then the July call for discussion. <clears throat> Next slide, please. At the April meeting, we also talked about those areas that broadly the board didn't support. So there's some areas where we've said, let's take these things off the table. The first one is expanding the auditor's responsibilities to detect all non-material fraud or third party fraud, not directly related to material misstatement in the financial statements. And that was not supported for standard setting, but we thought possibly could have some non-authoritative guidance, although that is something we would fit in rather than concentrate on because our emphasis will be on standard setting. We also decided um, not to change um, ISQM2 on engagement quality reviews. That is obviously a new standard that is not yet tested, so we didn't think it was appropriate to change it at this stage. We also um, had support for not any further refining or, de or um, defining the expectation gap. We did that in the discussion paper and the emphasis of the board um, going forward is how we work as a part of the ecosystem to um, educate, to um, um, talk to people about how each part of the ecosystem works and um, what you can expect from them. So I'll come back to that a little um, later. We also um, had a strong call in the letters to do some root causes analysis to make sure that the work we were doing was grounded in real cases, not in theory. We've obviously got a whole lot of theory um, backing it as well, but there was a strong call in the response letters for some root cause analysis. So the staff, with the support from board members, 
um, identified a number of agencies and so we have spoken they have spoken to regulators, law enforcement agencies, firms and others to pull together some analysis. Um, that analysis is almost completed and it will be presented as part of the package of papers for the December meeting. Um, it's fair to say it has been really useful to get that root cause analysis. Um, mainly it has confirmed those issues that have already been raised in the round tables, the academic research and the response letters. Nevertheless, it has um, reinforced a couple of issues that um, we need to just pay some attention to. Next slide, please. Okay, the June board discussion was where we started to look at those issues where there were either mixed views across um, people or we needed to do further analysis to understand what was being told to us. And um, I now am going to, at a high level, run through those six issues. Obviously, our rationale is more fully set out in the um, board papers that have been provided to you. Um, <clears throat> the first issue related to the introduction in 240, which um, the feedback suggested to us that the tone of that introduction is largely negative about what the auditor doesn't do, and that was very deliberate um, when the standard was set, rather than what the auditor does do. And so <clears throat> we have, as a working group, proposed to use clearer and more positive um, language on the role of the auditor. <clears throat> um, there are still mixed views in the board about how much um, just changing the emphasis will change the behaviour of auditors, but um, we need to obviously think more of that in detail as we do the standard setting and the revising of 240. Um, <clears throat> the, there was a, um, a question in the, um, in the discussion paper on whether forensic specialists should be used in audits in all cases. And the working group um, <coughs> suggested that um, forensic specialists should be used in certain circumstances. For example, um, in risk assessment processes or when a fraud is detected. And that was largely supported by the board. Um, there was agreement that the definition of fraud <clears throat> will not be revised to include bribery and corruption. Um, they are terms that are used differently across the world, not saying they're not important, but it will be very hard to get an international definition that works for everybody. So we um, intend to... Um, clarify the concepts and how they link together. And there'll also be a link, obviously, to 250 on laws and regulations. Next slide, please. Um, there was a um, discussion in the, in the paper on suspicious mindset and whether in the fraud standard we should move to using a suspicious mindset. Um, that has not gained support from the working, from uh, many respondents from the working group or from the board. Um, we believe that um, enhancing professional scepticism and using examples of that in the standard would be more suitable. It's important that auditors, like other professionals, have an open and objective mind and suspicious mindset um, is not consistent with that. 
Um, in terms of the rebuttable presumption of fraud and revenue recognition, there's some suggestion that we should move away from it, um, but the board has decided that rather than moving away from it, we should clarify that it is when it is appropriate to rebut instead of when it is inappropriate. And we all, finally, we talked about enhancements to external um, confirmations, um, but only to the extent specific to fraud. External confirmations are certainly um, being subject to a lot more technology and a lot more automation, um, but that's a bigger issue than just fraud. So there is a um, careful scoping issue for us in terms of external confirmations. Um, finally, next slide, please. Um, just a minute, I just need to catch up with my slides. July, thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the July meeting had um, the final four specific issues raised with us, and they were probably the more contentious issues in terms of the discussion paper with the um, greatest um, variety of views, and that then um, played forward into the board meeting. I won't go through all the discussion of that. I will tell you where we got to on each one. Um, on the first one, there are very um, polarised views in terms of more transparency in the auditor report. We have people that think there should be um, changes to the um, auditor's report. We have people that say, um, there should be no changes. Where the board has landed is that we should further explore whether there are appropriate changes that can be made to the auditor report that will be effective for users and investors in terms of understanding what work has been done in terms of fraud and what risks um, are in play. So, that is something we will give serious consideration to. Um, we certainly did get support for enhancing engagement team um, discussions. These should not be perfunctory. They should be um, detailed discussions on the fraud risks um, at various stages of the audit. And we also talked about having appropriate experts joining those team discussions to make sure that um, they were robust and helpful in terms of identifying the risks of fraud in particular entities. Um, <clears throat> the next issue I've already alluded to, and I know it was talked about in your March meeting, is the relationship between 240 and 250. Um, the proposal is to consider it um, for guidance, but we're also open to further exploring whether we can put some cross-references into the standard and a conforming amendment to 250. And finally, <clears throat> There is the issue of what an auditor should do if they identify or suspect fraud. The um, provisions for this in the 240 are spread in, across the standard and the working group's proposal was to bring them all together, which would strengthen the emphasis on that area. The board cautioned us that that might not be enough. So in the project proposal, we will be open to what more might be needed. Next slide, please. Um, 
the final thing we talked about at the March meet at the July meeting, sorry, was we have this is the first um, revised standard that will be in play when the monitoring group's public interest framework comes into being. So we decided to try and incorporate the um, <coughs> ideas and um, requirements of the framework into this project proposal. And at the July meeting, we provided um, the board with an initial attempt at identifying the key public interest issues, the project objectives, and the project scope. It's fair to say we got support for the, um, for the concept, but um, a lot of input and useful ideas in terms of the wording and the specificity of um, what we were proposing there. And just to give you um, some sense, next slide please, of the public interest issues that we um, <clears throat> are proposing to look at in, um, and will include in the project proposal, we have five. And if I have been clear in this presentation, they should all be familiar um, to you because um, all of the issues address these public interest issue, interests. First one is to ensure that we um, have the appropriate role and responsibility of the auditor in relation to fraud in financial statements. The second one relates to the connection of 240 to other standards to foster integrated risk-based approach. That goes back to the initial meeting in terms of 350 and um, includes internal controls, et cetera. The third one is to facilitate transparent communication between the auditor and those charged with governance and those within the organization and within the auditor's report. Um, fourthly, our um, important topic of continuing to foster professional scepticism, and the fifth one of addressing um, advances in technology. So that, in a nutshell, are the areas that we have identified as um, public interest issues. They do connect tidally to the um, PIF, and um, we will be pulling together all of these interests together with the issues I've just talked about um, for the December meeting. Next slide, please. So what are our next steps? Firstly, we have to complete the root cause analysis. Secondly, we have to complete prepare the draft project proposal. We do have a, um, a second draft of that. So we are continuing to work on that. And there are at least two working group meetings um, to finalize that proposal. We have a, um, we wish to put the plan, the project proposal to CAG. So it means I think that we might need a meeting before the December meeting, and I believe that is being worked on as we speak. Um, and we will then put it, as I have said, probably on more than one occasion for approval at the December meeting. Um, that will probably have a turnaround. So we will um, have to um, provide a draft um, take the input and provide another draft before it goes to um, the board for approval. Um, then the um, work on um, opening up to 40 and considering all of these issues in detail and redrafting sections will start. 
So that completes my presentation. Um, next slide, please. I look forward to your any comments or questions that you might have or um, from any of the staff, anything that they'd like to add to what I've said. Thank you, John. Thank you, Lynn. And I imagine we're gonna have a, quite a few comments on this, uh, but I will kick it off with Robert. You have the floor. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the presentation. That was very helpful. Um, and I was, was sort of pleased to see when you mentioned communication at the end, because you know, I think when this first started, we talked about an expectation gap. And I think there's, I still have a concern that those charged with corporate governance uh, feel their responsibility isn't as great, or the auditor has a greater responsibility to detect and prevent fraud than they do. Um, so the, the fact that you're, you're addressing that is, is very helpful. Thank you, Robert. Uh, Paul. Paul. There we go. Sorry, having a trouble unmuting. Um, a, a couple of observations, a couple of questions, and thank you, thank you, Lynn. This is uh, very helpful and, and very important work. Uh, an observation, and it's kind of along the lines of what Robert was just speaking to, <clears throat> of of uh, Changing the language to be more positive, I think, is is hugely important. As I as I think about the topic of fraud, the audit profession has, for I guess the last 75 or 80 years, always started the discussion with what the auditor's not responsible for. And I think changing the dialogue to start with what the auditor is responsible for is extremely important. Uh, to to help uh, guide the narrative and hopefully to change the mindset among some auditors as to what exactly their responsibility uh, is. So I think that is is a very important step forward. Uh, with respect to the the uh, support on on use of forensic specialists, I didn't see it here, but I'm, I'm going to take it as an assumption and maybe a hope that that would be tied to the risk assessment and would be then a potential response to identified fraud risk as opposed to a uh, score stirth approach of, of bringing in forensic specialists kind of on a, on a um, uh, hunting expedition. So, so hopefully that can be clarified as the, as the, as the project moves along. And, and then a couple of, uh, I think are, are, are questions. Um, <clears throat> where you have your discussion of expanding the responsibility of the auditor to detect, to detect all non-material fraud or third-party fraud. Qu first question is, I guess I don't know what you mean by third-party fraud, so I guess I'd appreciate a little uh, clarification on that. And then secondly, when you're speaking about non-material fraud, are you, are you really speaking about non-material fraud, or are you perhaps bringing in the notion that assessments of materiality involve, involve both quantitative and qualitative factors and fraud would be a hugely important qualitative factor that might cause relatively small quantitative amounts to, to be material. So I, I guess any perspective you have on either of those would be very helpful for me. But thank you very much for the work on this. It's moving along very well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Kazuhiro? Uh, thank you, James, and uh, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have uh, three comments. I would like to make three comments. Uh, the first point is how to uh, narrow the expect expectation gap. The fraud handled by the uh, auditors is limited to results that lead to misstatement of financial statements. But some users think that the auditor in should investigate the fraud of the company, uh, like a prosecution or the police. Uh, 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 
it is expected that this gap in expectation will be narrowed by the uh, 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 describe, describing what the uh, auditor will implement as an audit procedure in relation to come in audit report. Uh, in addition to this, it may be useful for audit firms to explain what the accounted auditor uh, does, for example, in transparency reports or web and website. Uh, for example, uh, PwC serves as a secretariat for uh, CLAF, Corporate Reporting Users Forum, and helping institutional investors and analysts better understand accounting and auditing standards. I hope that other major audit firms will also make such efforts. And the second point is about professional skepticism. I feel the definition of the suspicious mindset in the discussion paper is unclear. Uh, professional skepticism is not supposed to change the initially neutral view of management's integrity. However, suspicious mindset seems to presuppose the existence of fraud. Uh, with such an attitude, it is difficult to establish uh, a smooth relationship with management and those charged with governance. And uh, uh, it is not possible to collect sufficient information, and as a result, fraud may be overlooked. The discussion paper refers to Japanese standard to Japanese standard to address risks uh, of fraud in an audit. This standard requires auditor to maintain professional skepticism and exercise throughout the audit process. And in addition, if necessary, auditor are required to increase professional skepticism in determining whether there is any suspicious suspicion of material misstatement due to fraud and in performing the audit procedures to address such a suspicion. I think this response has the same effect as introducing suspicious mindset. Instead of introducing suspicious mindset, I think Increasing professional skepticism can do the same. Uh, the third point is how to respond to the utilization of IT technology and new specialists. Advancing new IT technologies are making it possible to audit all trans transactions rather than sample-based audits. The use of AI to detect fraud has also been researched or studied studied. Uh, in addition, uh, if there is a high possibility that fraud has been committed, it is possible to utilize a certified fraud exam examiner or forensic audit. An audit procedure without notice by the audit could also be an effective method. Uh, in Japanese standards says uh, incorporation of an element of unpredictability. Uh, uh, it is desirable that the IWSB to collect research and analysis about the usage of new technologies, the use of certified fraud examiner, conducting forensic audit and audit procedure without prior notice uh, to management. And then uh, issue audit practice notes or reflect the finding in the standards. Thank you. Thank you, Kazuhiro. Uh, Lynn, do you want to answer or, or respond to some of those, or do you want me to continue on? No, it would be good if I um, get these ones out of the my head so I can move to the next one. Okay. Um, I think that point about those charged with governance is a really important one. And I don't think that just standard setting is going to be enough in that regard. And certainly, we've talked about being an active member of the ecosystem and education to try and bridge the gap because it is absolutely true that all, 
a lot of the drivers for people as auditors should be finding all of this fraud, which is the desire and the reality is very different from that. Um, and those charged with governance do need to understand their role and play it. And we do know that um, that tone at the top, that culture of an organisation is absolutely vital about whether you have fraud or whether you don't. Um, <clears throat> thanks for those comments about positive language and tone. We um, do see 240 having a different tone going forward. So it's good to have some endorsement of that. And I can confirm for forensic specialists, we are linking it to risk assessment. And that's particularly important for the LCE um, sector who patently on a small audit having a forensic scientist where there's a very um, a specialist when there's a very low risk doesn't make any sense. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the non-material fraud, um, <clears throat> even though we're not changing the setting away from material fraud and financial statements, we're very um, aware of the fact that fraud starts small and multiply. And so there is a cumulative effect. So we just want to make sure we cover that. Um, thanks for the comments about the expectation gap. Um, our primary role will to be doing standard setting in that um, mode. But as I've already said, um, we also want to be an active player in the ecosystem and play our part for everybody to understand roles and responsibilities. Um, thanks for the comments about professional scepticism. I endorse those. And certainly um, using technology for analysis to support um, fraud is um, definitely something that we have talked about and will consider going forward. And um, we are looking at the new standard in Japan as well as the one in the United Kingdom. So they will um, form part of our considerations going forward. So thank you very much for that. I think that's it. I've probably missed something, but those are some of the issues. Thanks, James. Thanks, Where? Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks for the links update of the project. Uh, it is an important project for the public interest based on high profile fraud cases in the capital market. I really appreciate the work has been done by the work group. I would like to make a comment about more transparency in the auditor's report. It was dis discussed a lot in the agenda paper for reference. Stock exchange endeavor to improve the transparency of the markets. One important way is to encourage quality disclosure from listed companies. From my perspective, more transparency in the auditor's report will contribute to narrow the performance gap as well as expectation gap, which will contribute to improve disclosure quality. I would like to encourage the work group to reach to more stakeholders to seek their views about transparency and to promote transparency in the auditor's report. That's all, thanks a lot. Thanks, Wei. Don? Uh, thanks for the presentation, uh, Lynn. Just a couple quick comments uh, that the SMPAG has asked me to um, pass along. Uh, we certainly appreciate this is a really important project. Um, I think it's going to be important to well understand what it is that we're trying to achieve. You have a tremendous number of public interest issues here. And uh, I, I can see that it's going to be quite challenging to, to address all of those. So um, just a caution, I guess, that engagement will be needed with other stakeholders throughout the entire project as you move along so, so that we can, at the end of the day, achieve what we hope to. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Hilda. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Lynn, for um, the presentation. 
Uh, as you know, and as some on the CAC might know earlier this year, Accountancy Europe issued actually two papers. Uh, one was on going concern, but another one was on fraud. And uh, we called it recommendations to strengthen the financial reporting ecosystem. And I think that very much resonates with the point that Robert made and uh, also the, f the first point that uh, Lynn made in her last intervention. Uh, and that links back to uh, the point on those charged with governance. It's obviously not only about audit standards, but it's about the, the whole ecosystem. Because actually when we started on our project, we called it scope of audits. But when we were moving along, we realized it was not just about scope of audit. You had to look at the ecosystem and at the responsibilities of the different stakeholders uh, in uh, that ecosystem. So um, anything that can be done, even in an audit standard around that uh, will be uh, very useful. That being said, uh, uh, when uh, you know, I look at what our outcome was and what you have now put forward, what the uh, project proposal uh, will include, you will look at, uh, there is a remarkable amount of, of, of consistency. So we must have done something right there. So overall, we're, we're very supportive of, of, uh, of, of the project and, and how you're moving it uh, uh, along. Um, so um, good luck with that. Uh, there were two smaller points uh, that um, you talked about uh, from your June meeting, it was on uh, the repeatable presumption of risk of fraud in revenue recognition and the point related to external confirmations. Uh, not saying this is not important, but uh, you know, we don't recall they were in the discussion uh, paper that was issued uh, last year. So we were just wondering how they came about and, and what the real issues were that we presume came uh, from that consultation that uh, you would be trying to address. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hilda. Uh, Lynn, do you want me to continue on or? Yeah, might as well finish and then I'll call me. Okay, um, Akihito. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, great presentation. Uh, it is very helpful for me. Uh, I have two comments to share. Uh, the first, uh, I think uh, sufficient outreach activities should be uh, conducted, especially regarding the guidance of fraud risk in revenue recognition and uh, forensic specialists uh, to take into account the uh, differences uh, in the audit approaches and uh, practices among uh, countries uh, and industries. And the second point is, uh, as introduced by uh, Kazuhiro Yoshi-san, uh, in Japanese audit standard, uh, there is a specific audit standard addressed to fraud risk uh, for audits of listed entities, and this is built into uh, 240 audit standard. Uh, in the application material of the specific standard, there are some examples of the use of forensic specialists. Uh, for example, uh, support inquiries to management and other corporate uh, constitutes uh, or do inquiry by uh, forensic specialists themselves. Uh, advice on planning or uh, assist in implementation of journal entry testing related to fraud uh, as a risk, resp uh, risk response procedure. Uh, as we explained earlier, uh, I, also, I also think uh, it may be a good idea to refer to other jurisdictions uh, standards uh, such as this. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Akihito. Natasha. Great, thank you. Uh, and yes, th thank you very much for the, the very clear presentation. I mean, there's such a multitude of issues here, but I guess I, I really wanted to um, zoom in on, on the same point that others have made, including way earlier, 
about the audit of reporting and transparency. Um, certainly from a, uh, an investor's perspective, this is absolutely key. Um, uh, so what I would like to understand is why was this a controversial issue and what were the main uh, um, sources of debate? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Natasha. And I would add, I have a, a couple follow-up items um, from a previous discussion. And one was um, the CAG had mentioned the, the concept of a, a stand back or a step back if there's conflicting information out there that might indicate fraud. Uh, for example, let's say there's analyst reports that say that allege fraud within a company. And, and just thinking about that in terms of your, your fraud assessment. The, the other question is that come up is, is, I think it's in number two of your public interest in issues, or maybe it's not, it's number four in your public issue issues issues and that relates to professional skepticism and you know if you define it as a sort of a challenging mindset is there a, by putting it in there is there an action you're asking the auditors to do is it a documentation action is it just to have the thought or or what is it because there's some questions that have come up from that and probably third and in, in uh, given your background, then you'll probably appreciate what I'm going to say, but others may be surprised. Um, I support, for me, I support the idea of, of not, I'm glad you didn't scope in non-material fraud, because if you think, for example, in a public sector environment, you could have thousands and thousands of non-material frauds on any given period of time, and, and the auditor would actually never be able to, to uh, complete an audit if they were chasing down all the all the fraud. So those are my three. Okay. Do you want me to respond now, John? I don't see any other hand, so it's you have the floor. Um, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to deal with all of the issues other than revenue recognition and external confirmations, and Beverly is going to cover those two. Um, in terms of the transparency in the audit report, um, just to expand a little bit on that, on one side um, of, and it is a bit of a polar discussion at present, and our challenge is going to be to, there'll be an answer somewhere in the middle, on one side, people want it included in the auditor's um, report exactly what um, the risk of fraud is, what procedures were carried out, and what the um, <clears throat> auditor's opinion on that was. I'm, I'm being um, not subtle about this. I'm just giving you the different views. On the other side is the fact that the auditor's report already includes that we look for material misstatement due to error or fraud, and that going any further than that um, is unnecessary. The audit report um, actually isn't read as often as we'd like it to be, which I think is a sad indictment, however, and that extending the audit opinion any lot further um, is unnecessary, that also it um, could um, end up with boilerplate comments that don't actually mean anything, um, and that we already have a mechanism in the CAMS if it is a significant issue. So as you can see, the ideas are very, very varied and very different, and our challenge is um, to find a way through that. Um, one thing I think we have to be very careful of is there is a strong interrelationship between fraud and the criminal justice sector. And we need to make sure that what we do in terms of public reporting is consistent with that. And this is my personal opinion, putting in all audit procedures doesn't make sense to me. 
um, just because if you are a um, fraudster, what a wonderful present that would be. So we just have to be sensible and work a way through this. And I have no doubt there is a way through it. And I think some of the comments about engaging with stakeholders and finding out what the real needs are and running some scenarios by people will take us in that direction. Um, you're right about the number of challenging issues we have and each issue we try and take off the table, we end up with the conflicting views. So this is going to be an ongoing issue for us. Um, it doesn't mean we won't be able to do it. It just means we might have to um, take a little bit longer than we anticipated um, to work through some of these um, issues that there are very strong views on and they're equally um, good views on both sides. So we're just going to um, work our way through those issues. But as we work through them, if there are any issues that you think are less important, please let us know. And um, the external confirmations was one that we said is at the lower end. You know, if we had to take something off the table, that isn't our biggest issue at this point in time. So that's an example. Um, Accountancy Europe, yes, we've read your report and we had exactly the same reaction. Gee, that sounds very similar to what we're hearing. So it's good, um, it's good to have that work um, happening across the world and to keep in touch on it. Um, I note the comments around forensic specialists. They should be used when they're needed, not just as a matter of course, and they should be needed where there is a risk assessment that says they're needed. Um, in professional scepticism, Jim, it's an open question at present. You know, it's definitely a topic we have to ha um, address. Um, personally, I'd like it to be action orientated. We know that examples work in this area. Um, and one of the challenges the professional scepticism working group is looking at to pursue next year is how do we document professional scepticism, not just on fraud, but across the um, across all standards, because it's it's one of the perennial questions. So maybe we should think about it as one clump. Um, but that isn't um, decided yet. It's just the proposal of where we might go in professional scepticism. Um, um, <clears throat> understanding the environment you work in and the context is absolutely vital. And um, I think strengthening that, um, and it's a fundamental part of 315, so it will come through. And <clears throat> yes, the public sector was definitely, in my mind, Jim, about um, non-material fraud, because I can be absolutely certain that non-material fraud is happening in every single public sector, actually in every private sector right now, ongoingly, and it's a mission impossible for us to deal with that, it's not our role. And so um, shooting that home to those charged with governance and the management of entities is where that responsibility lies and it should lie. So um, I'll now hand to Bev who will talk about external confirmations and revenue recognition. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so when we issued the discussion paper, um, at that point in time, we, we had fairly limited um, information about sort of some of the issues in fraud. And one of the things we were aiming to do is to really make sure that we understood where all the issues were and what they were so that when we develop a project proposal and scope the project, we are really picking up all of the issues. Um, so both the, the rebuttable presumption of revenue recognition and the external confirmations came from that process. So um, the, I'll, I'll start with the external confirmations. Um, we didn't hear it a lot. There were a couple of people that raised it, but I think we decided that we would, um, on balance, um, take it to the board um, because it, it, within the environment, there have been a couple of recent frauds where external confirmations were problematic. Um, and we thought that together with some of the um, responses where people had said, are you thinking about the external confirmations and sort of the reliability of those um, perhaps that should also form part of this project. And we had the conversation with the board. 
um, the board themselves were not, they were not keen that we go beyond thinking about fraud in external confirmations. Um, obviously, we have our project on audit evidence and we'll coordinate with that project um, around um, ISA 505 on external confirmations. Um, and again, some of the aspects may be within 505 itself, and we may need to have a look at that standard. Some of it's related to technology. Um, so we really need to just unpack that and, and work out what we need to do in that area. So that's where the external confirmations had come from. The rebuttable presumption um, in revenue recognition, um, that came through both in the roundtables that we had, but also um, within the responses. And it was an area where there, there, there were mixed views. Um, there were some that thought it was a little bit of an old fashioned concept. Um, and are we sure that it's only um, in revenue recognition? Perhaps there's some other accounts and payments, some other things that we should be thinking about where there should be an automatic um, rebut of it. Um, we, when we, we talked a little bit more around this um, and also in doing some of the work, particularly the work that we're doing on, on root cause, I think has, has confirmed that a lot of the fraud still actually does happen in revenue. Um, so we're quite comfortable to leave the rebuttable presumption about revenue recognition, but perhaps think more about what we're asking the auditor to do. So um, perhaps thinking more about when it's inappropriate to rebut it. Um, and to also perhaps focus the auditor more on the actual risk identification and assessment process rather than trying to rebut the presumption um, of, of fraud in revenue recognition. So, so there is some work around that. And that sort of came from all of the comments and some of the discussions um, that we had in both the roundtables and the, um, the, the, um, the responses to the discussion paper. And then I just wanted to touch on one other one quickly, Jim, and you'd ask some questions around analyst reports and sort of thinking about a standback. So as Lynn has, has explained, we, we are going to be looking at, at all of the changes that we made within ISA 315, the one that's recently been revised, um, in particular the standback. But one of the areas that we have highlighted that we will be looking at is, is the fraud risk factors that the auditor is thinking about. And one of the fraud risk factors that we thought we could build in there is, is really around things like looking at what the analysts say, in particular the short sellers. Um, so they seem to be predicting the frauds a lot before anybody else is picking the frauds up. Um, so thinking about perhaps how we can build some of those sort of um, ex source, external sources of information as the auditor is thinking about fraud to, to have a look at those. Um, so I just, I just wanted to add that as well. So thank you. Thank you Thanks Beth. very much, Bev. Galen, you have your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jim. And I've been just sort of thinking about everything that's been said, and I agree with a, a great deal of it, including the idea of a stand back. And, uh, you know, on the on the brainstorming, that's what I call it, the, the discussions, if it were. Uh, I, I agree many times those are perfunctory. I don't know. Yeah. You know, it'll be a challenge to try to expand on on, on what, is, what is required and change behavior there. Uh, I think I think the discussions that that do take place can be can be effective, but uh, again, it, I think it'll be a challenge to to move it from where it already is. Uh, and then there, it seems to me like there's all kinds of different frauds, and I'm glad that we're we're focusing on material fraud. Uh, and uh, those frauds can affect the financial statements directly or indirectly. You had, Lynn, you had you had talked a bit about how bribery and corruption wasn't going to be directly linked into where the the task force or the working group might be going. And it, it seems to me like if those things impact financial statement fraud why would you exclude exclude those? And so maybe I'm not quite understanding why they would be outside the the the, uh, the box here of, of what we're dealing with. It, it seemed like you would include those. I, overall, I, I am more concerned with financial statement fraud than anything. I mean, the frauds that can take place where somebody steals something, uh, <laughs> You know, it, it's not material. There's lot, lots of different things that can go wrong, but it's the financial statement fraud that impacts the investors and public protection uh, where they're relying on the financial statements that I think uh, really ought to be the focus. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Thanks. Uh, um, yeah, can I, um, the point you make about um, 
behavior is absolutely spot on. And one of the challenges of standard setting is how do you get standard setting to actually positively influence behavior? And I think in a number of the issues we've talked about today, changing behavior um, is gonna be really important and how far we can get in standard setting is an open question at present. You know, saying to people, you must talk to people, you must be more comprehensive about things, um, only will take us so far. So it may well be after standard setting, there's still a gap of how you get those new behaviors um, ingrained in people. Um, not impossible, but not easy either. Um, I can't have been clear about bribery and corruption, and I apologise. We are going to address it. We're not going to add it specifically to the definition. So we're going to talk about how it fits in, and we would obviously expect if there was material bribery and corruption that affected the financial statements, it would be identified and it would be reported. So um, I'm sorry I wasn't clear in that. And it's good to have that endorsement of, yeah, it is material fraud that affects the financial statements, which is the focus of 240. It was in the past and it is our um, intention for it to be in the future um, because otherwise audits will become um, impractical if you had to find every single fraud across every single entity, it just would be impractical. So um, that endorsement um, by everybody in us um, not going for non-material fraud, I think is a um, very sensible and logical decision that's been made today. So, um, that, so thank you for those comments. And um, I think that's probably a good place to end, Jim, except I should ask um, the three staff, um, Bev, um, Angela and Hankin, and also one of my um, working group colleagues, Len, if there's anything they'd like to contribute before we finish. I'm taking silence as no. <laughs> thank you thank Anna. you very much Jim and I do appreciate the input and the discussion that we've had it's been very professional and constructive and I'm very grateful for your input thank you thank you we appreciate your time okay well now we have two more sessions and we'll be able to conclude All right, are we ready to move on? Are we having a technical issue? Check with Alex. Are you ready to carry on? Uh, I am, Phil. Yes. There we go. Um, Let me go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So our next topic, uh, we've talked about thinking strategically and thinking about topics that were on the horizon, but not necessarily part of the standard setting process. And I think one of the topics that's very relevant right now is the whole area of cybersecurity. So Alex Ned is going to talk to us just to think about cybersecurity. Uh, Alex, welcome, and I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I will share up my screen here as well. Uh, hi, everyone, uh, in whatever time zone you are in. Uh, my name is Alex Nettie, uh, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about cybersecurity. Um, we're going to review it from a high level as a, a level set uh, to get an idea about what the industry is and is not. 
Uh, we'll also talk about some trends and some considerations uh, as the industry continues to grow and mature. So at a high level, uh, here's uh, my face in two places now for you. Uh, I've worked directly in the, the cybersecurity industry now for about a decade. Uh, here in the United States, I've helped support uh, United States federal agencies and state and local governments, uh, but I've also worked closely within the private sector uh, across a number of different industries, uh, including healthcare, financial, uh, out into Silicon Valley, uh, utilities, and other critical infrastructure. Within cybersecurity, um, as you'll find out here shortly, it is a very diverse field uh, with a lot of ways that we manage it and look at it and address it. Some of them are more technical and some of them are more non-technical, more in the management and overall risk management realms. Um, within that space as well, I, I hold multiple industry certifications. So starting at the top, um, what is cybersecurity? Uh, and you may have heard about it in the news. Uh, you might think of it as a very confusing concept, something that you can never understand. Uh, you might think of it as something that is expensive, that needs lots of tooling, uh, or you think it might be involved with uh, individuals that sit in dark rooms and uh, mash away on their keyboards to, to make it happen. Um, but one of the big things and one of the large misnomers about cybersecurity is, again, that it is a broad field. Uh, it doesn't necessarily sit just within the world of IT, uh, but it crosses more into the business and overall risk management than you might believe. When we think about the world of IT, though, uh, one of the big things is that organizations and companies used to do business by paper. Uh, we moved to electronic methods because they offered convenience, speed, and efficiency that paper just couldn't afford. Uh, that opened up a, a world of opportunities. Uh, so, for example, here, thinking in the world of healthcare, uh, for a long time, we would have patient records in clipboards. Uh, they were on the ends of the beds. They were readily available for doctors. Uh, but they weren't very good at letting multiple doctors take a look at the information or for multiple people to come in and only see the information that they were supposed to see. So we started to move to computers. Uh, obviously, that lets us have electronic healthcare records, maybe sharing information between different doctors in different locations, states, or even countries, uh, but also maybe limiting access to only people who are authorized to see it. Today, though, we look at how healthcare has really been powered up by the world of IT. Uh, that's including big data, uh, things like AI and blockchain and all of these other buzzwords that you hear about are helping to empower and make better healthcare decisions and outcomes for the entire industry at large. So that's taken something that was very archaic and that it was on paper on the end of a bed and made it readily available uh, and had a large opportunity to process that at speeds and power that we never had before. So where does that take us? Well, we have to think about how we protect that information. Uh, this is the, the key piece is that when we think about it in the physical world, it's easy for us to think about how we protect tangible items. We can put locks on buildings or build stronger buildings. We can have safes or guards or alarm systems. All of those are great to protect individuals or paper, but how do we do the same in the electronic realm? Uh, obviously here's a, a burglar coming in, um, but what does that actually look like in reality within the world of cybersecurity? Well, it comes down to the fundamental core concept of cybersecurity, and it focuses on three main areas. The first is confidentiality. We're focused on protecting and keeping secret information secret. We want to make sure that only the right people can access that information. When you think cybersecurity uh, or some of these other terms we'll discuss today, like information security or information risk management, this is probably what you think about, keeping secret things secret. But there's a second one in here that focuses on the integrity of that information. This is trusting that an IT system is going to keep your information the same. So when you deposit $100 into the bank and your bank account shows that it has $100, you would expect that your online bank account will always show it as 100 unless you adjust that transaction. If that number changes to a one, that's been a breach of the integrity. So it's important that we have that same trust in our electronic systems that we had in that paper that used to hang on the end of that hospital bed. The third part though is availability. And this is a key part that if you're relying on an IT system to do something critical, uh, that IT system needs to be available. So whereas that piece of paper on the end of the bed was always available to doctors and nurses to understand what the health outcomes for that patient were, that same needs to be said for the same systems that are now processing it electronically. If those healthcare records aren't available for that doctor, how could they know what's been prescribed for that patient or make those same decisions without access to that information? 
When we think about newsworthy items like ransomware, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that's a huge breach of the availability of that information. The people who need access to it can no longer get access to it. So when we think about it at a high level within the world of IT, IT is about getting IT systems, their components, assisting businesses and organizations uh, with just working. Uh, the goal is to get something that works for that company. So whether it's email, uh, custom built app, financial software, or anything in between, it just needs to work. But in the world of cybersecurity, we want that same thing, but we want it to work securely. So a good example is if you go to a coffee shop and you log on to the wireless there, uh, if it doesn't have that lock symbol on it, it works, right? You can connect out to the internet and surf. But we also want that same scenario in the world of cybersecurity. And that's why we recommend only Wi-Fi that has a password on it. That adds that layer of protection, but it still also works. Um, you'll hear this field called a number of things, depending on different companies and organizations. You'll hear it called information security, IT risk management, IT security, InfoSec. Uh, the concept is still the same, uh, but colloquially, we now reference it as the cybersecurity industry. So how do we reduce, reduce risk and misuse? Well, let's look at some of the trends that are occurring here in 2021. The biggest one that you are probably intimately familiar with is ransomware. Uh, within the U.S. alone, it's estimated that it's going to cost U.S. businesses about $20 billion this year. Uh, that is a staggering increase from the projections that were just from last year in 2020, where we estimated that to be closer to seven to nine billion. Uh, that is a huge jump and has been a, a huge opportunity for criminals to take advantage of bringing businesses down. Uh, the hard part is it's been easy for criminals to use ransomware. Uh, they need little technical knowledge, and there is even ransomware as a service now that's available where criminals can log on and download this software from hacker groups that have actually built it. They don't have to understand how it works. They can just use it. Uh, the same as if you went and bought Microsoft Word or any other financial app, you may not know the underlying workings of how it works, but you know that it works for you and does what you need it to do. This has caused a huge expansion in ransomware, and it's really becoming a large problem. The hard part is there's no easy answer to it. Uh, it's a number of systematic failures that have occurred over the years. Uh, a lack of understanding within organizations of the technology they're using, not training people, uh, insecure servers and configurations. A lot of it adds up and leaves businesses vulnerable. The second one is data breaches. Uh, these can occur maliciously, but also unintentionally. Uh, as I just talked about, the pace of IT innovation for companies has exceeded the pace of protecting that information. So as companies race to the cloud or race to power up their organizations with AI and other software that's being sold to them, oftentimes they're not doing the due diligence to say, hey, I understand that this works, but does it work securely? And taking that time can help reduce that risk. Not to mention that with the COVID-19 pandemic ongoing, remote work has created a wider footprint creates more opportunities for information to go missing. Again, this can occur maliciously from hacker groups or otherwise, but also unintentionally. Uh, if somebody sends the wrong information to the wrong email recipient or downloads information and loses their laptop, those can be data breaches that can cause big impacts to businesses. Finally, the internet of things, uh, also known as IoT. This includes things like phones, thermostats, uh, the cameras, smart homes, any of these devices that have moved on from what we traditionally used to think of as just our one computer device, our maybe laptop or our desktop computer, now there's lots of things that connect out to the internet. Uh, that's caused a rapid expansion of IT footprints within businesses, uh, from managing buildings to the heating, ventilation, and cooling systems that exist within offices, all the way down to the nitty gritty like phones or the thermostats that control vents on the floors or even the lights. All of those things together create an extra large footprint that can create larger problems for the business. As you can see, these cross a variety of those three areas that we just talked about, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And they all focus on protecting the data uh, and making sure that it is available, that it's the same, uh, and that it stays secret and, and only available to the people who should have access to it. The way we look at risk is very similar to risk in other industries. Uh, and this has been a big part of the cybersecurity industry at large and its growth. While a large part of the industry is very technical in its nature in terms of the tools and some of the processes and the way it's approached, 
it's actually starting to get more closely aligned to other audit capabilities, uh, where we look at addressing risk in similar fashions to other industries, and more importantly, try to find what some of the chief risks are within the industry and how to control those. Um, you may have seen a similar model or diagram before where we look at initial threats, the things that could go wrong, hacker groups, ransomware, uh, even things like tornadoes and fires. All of those uh, can have prevention activities put in place to reduce that risk. So if we can identify those risks and create protections around them, it can reduce those. One of the big things though, in the differentials here is that within the world of IT, we have the ability to detect when things go wrong. Uh, and having that capability to properly detect when things go wrong is a key piece of this puzzle because ultimately we have to respond to that. Uh, within cybersecurity, we have a phrase that it's not if, but when something will go wrong. And so our abilities, you can see, to be able to detect and understand when that happens and then respond and recover are a key piece of this puzzle. Building up large walls on our castle to try to keep hackers out isn't good enough in 2021. And we have to be able to detect and respond accordingly to actually reduce the overall risk to the business. Uh, those risks, of course, turn into the impacts of the business, like downtime, lost revenue, lost data. So what happens when that information is stolen? Uh, for those of you in the compliance space, you may have heard about some of these, either HIPAA here in the US or the PCI DSS, uh, where we're protecting credit cards and healthcare information. they are big fines for when things go wrong uh, and businesses who manage this information have a responsibility to meet these requirements. Not every company and organization though has these same compliance requirements. Uh, many just need to protect it due to due diligence or many companies take on the world of cybersecurity and try to address those risks to protect their reputation. Um, what can ultimately happen is you wanna protect that reputational and prevent that reputational damage from occurring. Uh, customers and clients could lose trust and it could be forcing your company to shut down. Uh, not to mention external investigations are a big piece of this puzzle. Uh, you may have seen this recently with some of the larger ransomware breaches that recently happened within the US between the Colonial Pipeline and JBS, the meat supplier, uh, larger federal investigations got launched as a result of that. So even though those companies are back up and running, they're still involved in many investigations after the fact. So how do we control risk within cybersecurity then? Uh, well, the interesting thing is that many businesses, uh, as you all know, are unique in how they operate, uh, but IT is not. Uh, and it's very similar sometimes to the way we look at GAP in terms of accounting principles and how we manage books. Businesses will have different ways of doing things, but there are generally accepted ways of handling that. IT is very similar to that, where we look at things like apps and servers being adjusted and customized and tailored to meet a business need. The way that you maybe use Microsoft Office might be different than another company, but the general concept is the same. Over time, we've started to realize that there's different way that those threats, that first part of that diagram I showed you, can come in uh, and that those threats are limited in terms of what they can do uh, and more importantly, what areas of the business they can impact. So as a result, we've been able to create a standardized set, more or less, of security controls. The hard part, we haven't quite agreed on what that looks like. Uh, the industry as it is, is still very young. It is still very mature when compared to some other industries like accounting uh, or other audit standards. So the hard part is when we think about how to address them, there are specific compliance requirements that some groups have come out with, like we talked about for HIPAA and healthcare information, and also PCI for credit cards, but they are usually focused on a specific segment of that industry. The best way is establishing security controls using known frameworks. Uh, within the world, and, and especially here in the US, there are a number of them uh, that are considered standards. Uh, and as you can see, as this diagram goes up and through, the ones on the left uh, cover a little bit less and the ones up on the, the upper right there cover a little bit more in terms of what they're trying to address. Uh, these frameworks have been usually pulled together by different groups and boards uh, like ISO, uh, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology here in the United States. And what they've done is try to look at all of the risks that can occur within an IT system, and more importantly, developed the security controls for reducing those risks. Uh, ultimately, meeting those security controls, uh, that risk can be reduced to a tolerable level, but it can help businesses be more informed in terms of what technology uh, and things they need to invest in to reduce that risk to an acceptable level. For a lot of areas of cybersecurity, uh, the hardest part is that it covers a lot of parts. Uh, within a company, it covers not only the technology part, 
but it also includes the processes, the things that make the business go. Uh, it can include decisions like at the C-suite or anywhere in between or at the board level. And finally, down to the people that work at the company. Everybody has a role within cybersecurity. And so it's a very wide uh, industry and ultimately a wide space to be in because there are so many parts to it. This has made it very difficult to manage and adjust it and honestly creates a lot of the confusion around it. Um, hopefully, this helps you understand a little bit more about what the industry means, uh, where it's going, and how it will continue to mature. Uh, but one of the big things to keep an eye on in the future is how it grows and how it will be handled. Uh, as technology changes, cybersecurity will have to change with it. Uh, and to be frank, where we are today is not where we will be in five years for this industry. Uh, so it'll be a very interesting space to continue to watch. Uh, in practice, uh, here's a great example in terms of passwords and reducing risk. Uh, you hear about this all the time. You need to have strong individual passwords and they need to be a thousand characters long and randomized. But the question is why? What is the risk? Well, there's a lot of tools out there that hackers can use to actually try to guess your passwords. Uh, and in doing that, if you have a weak password, as you can see here in this table, some of them can be guessed instantly by a computer today. Uh, as technology gets more powered up, that purple part at the top is slowly going to slide down this table. Uh, and we as cybersecurity professionals are in a bit of a position where we're kind of being squeezed against the wall now. We need to find a better way to manage passwords and how they can work for people. The best recommendation right now, and some of you may already take advantage of this, is a password manager. Uh, some of them come from companies like 1Password, LastPass, and Dashlane. And they can help you manage your passwords, create individual and strong passwords. And that way, for companies who fail to manage their cybersecurity and maybe have a data breach and your passwords are stolen, uh, you can use your password manager to go in and create a new password very easily. More importantly, uh, if, when you reuse passwords, if a hacker is able to get a hold of your password, they can go elsewhere and try to log in with it. That's why we preach this a lot. And we always talk about having those strong passwords. When you couple that with multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, which is where you maybe get a, a code on your mobile phone or use a separate app to enter another number, that provides the greatest protection. Um, from that side, one of the biggest things that you can do within the world of cybersecurity is just stay on top of it. Um, it is in the news a lot. Certain things are covered. Uh, but the hard part is what you don't know will hurt you. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that are going on within the world of IT and cybersecurity. Um, staying on top of them is critical. Uh, so watching the news, following on social media, and just keeping an eye on the industry at large. Uh, it is a very exciting and interesting space at this time. Uh, it has a lot going on. Uh, from our company, we have some free guides and uh, our threats blog that we write about all of this stuff on that you're welcome to follow. Um, but definitely stay on top of it because it is something that is going to impact businesses more and more. It's not something just for the world of IT. It's something for everybody. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. I think of the, there's an intersection between the, the cybersecurity as well as auditing in a sense of um, risk. And also in the sense we just heard, a, we're doing some um, work in the area of fraud. So there's, there's a lot of uh, synergies in a sense. Let me see from the audience if, there, if anyone has any questions for Alex on this particular topic. I think we maybe you've had a question about cybersecurity that you've been too afraid to ask your uh, company. Uh, I promise I won't judge if you want to ask it now. <laughs> I'm going to change my password to password. So please don't do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you for providing that uh, that information to us. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you. Lastly, we have the closed session, which. Phil, I'll go, I'll go to you to see if there's any. Yeah, you have to... um, uh, if, there, if there's nothing, um, Jim, you may close the, the public session. And once that happens, uh, we will um, just remove the public observers as, as well as anybody other than the representatives as well as um, the official observers. So you, you can just clarify whether there's any other official business and then Jasper and I will start to remove those that should not be in the closed session. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, I have one hand that says iPhone, but I don't know who that I is. I think that's probably the PIB observer. <laughs> Dr. Chen, are you, is that you? 
There you are. Chairman. There you are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you all. Uh, it is my first time observing the SSP or SSP-related activities. Since joining the PIOB uh, uh, just in, uh, in last April, you know, I just uh, uh, learned a lot from the two-day session. Uh, that proves to be operating well and uh, fruitful. I'm happy that, you know, having the chance working together with you. With the two days experiences involved with the two CACs, I was impressed by the efforts made improving the auditor, auditor standards so as to better serve the public interest. Following that, I just, I just want to give some minor comments on the specific projects, just a few words. So uh, with regard to, uh, the group audit, I observed that the revisions focusing on addressing key matters, including those raised by the PIOB, be going well in the right direction, that is commendable. With regard to the work plan, I observed that comprehensive survey conducted and the responses gathered and deliberated, it is you know, applaudable. Among those suggestions as raised by stakeholders, also by the CA CAG representatives yesterday, uh, is assurance of climate change disclosures and of sustainability report. That is really worth our consideration, given the birth of the IWSB. I applaud on that. Also, while considering adding the new project in terms of prioritization, Similar consideration is also needed with regard to the management of the ongoing projects. With regard to audit evidence, I have not much to say at this moment, just adding one point, say, as IT believe, TF believe that there may be cases of duplication of requirements across I ISA. And we'll consider whether some uh, requirements in other ISA may be better placed in ISA 500. However, I just believe there is a, is a risk that moving requirements across the suite of ISAs will end in missing some of them. It might be meaningful to carefully evaluate whether some requirements are more relevant in ISA 500 and as such, applicable to different phases of audit. As far as uh, CASP, I want to add my support on the project to what the PIOB ever officially expressed, that the ISA improved following those drafting principles, though only at the level of format and the structure of the text, may still better serve the public interest. Specifically, I would I like to add that based on my personal experience in defining the term of complexity, the issue of length of sentences could, would be included. In Chinese language, a sentence longer than one and a half line or two lines is rarely seen or not welcome. In my reading experiences of the ISAs or also IFRS, very often, you know, we see sentences longer than two or three lines that I thought pose a big burden on those non-native English speakers, at least the readers from China. So also in my mind, the project CASP is much more meaningful for those non-native English language speakers and the profession in the developing jurisdictions. So those then those are opposite. If the observations above is correct, I would propose that at the following stages, comments could be mainly sought from those mentioned above. Similarly, outreach activities could be conducted this way, many. So uh, lastly, for the fraud, as concerned about by the PIOB, this public interest issues list. We do hope that a key element of the revisions should be include a meaningful revision of ISA 240 to ensure that frauds are properly identified and reported by auditors and the considerations about transparency in auditor report, given the situation, you know, 
uh, uh, across the world, you know, we are challenged by the frauds that just the, uh, uh, seriously influence uh, or harm the, the quality of financial information. So uh, that's all of my comments. I really appreciate the chance involved in discussions in past two days sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Chen. We're very happy that you joined us for the meeting and got and had a chance to see how the, the CAG interacts and the thoughtful discussion we have. And thank you for your points <clears throat> on the various topics that we covered in the last couple of days. Lastly, I, with the respect to the public meeting, I wanted to cover uh, the uh, next CAG meetings. And there is going to be a, a CAG call likely at the end of November or in early December to further discuss the fraud project proposal. And given the interest in that, I think that would be a very interesting call. Uh, secondly, the meeting for the spring is going to be on March the 7th through the 9th. And, and that's for both CAG meetings. And then if you want to hold your calendar out for the future, September 6th through the 8th, uh, 2022, I can't believe I'm saying 2022, um, for the uh, next fall meeting. And um, the optimum allocations between the fraud, between the IWSB and the IESB CAG will be determined. So with that, I'm going to close the public meeting and the public session, and then we will have a final closed session, and that will be it for the day. Thank you, Phil.